Welcome back to another episode of Out of Bounds on the Boomer Bus channel, a podcast where I give my social commentary on different topics in today's society. I'm your host, Terry, and today we are going with part two of our series, and I have a guest joining me, and we're going to have a conversation about um, identity, some of the racial tension, and other things happening in America. Um, I want to start off by saying, once again, my guests will remain anonymous, so um, we want to have an honest dialogue, so no information or social media stuff is going to be shared, and I ask everybody to respect that. And then, as always, I ask, I'm speaking from my point of view and my perspective. I don't speak for everybody in my race or culture, and I'm not asking my guests to either. So um, let's just have a respectful conversation, and everybody respects that, hopefully. So uh, with all that being said, we'll, we'll jump right into it. So um, the first question I wanted to talk about was the George Floyd case. And so... I just, from your perspective, kind of, what was the timeline of you finding out about it, either the case or the protest, and kind of what were your initial thoughts when you saw uh, what was happening around it? Well, my, my timeline is I, I saw it pretty much uh, as soon as it started appearing on the major news networks, um, and I saw it through Facebook, and uh, just having, having read about it, and having seen uh, what went on with uh, Ahmad Aubrey and just what goes on in this country, I just knew that, uh, especially how things happened and how he was, excuse my voice for getting shaky there, but how he was pleading with those police officers to just let him breathe. It was, it, it's painful to see. And I don't, I don't see how anybody could be treated like that. And um, it's, it's disgusting in a way. And just having followed it and um, having uh, worked in a black community for the past 10 years, I, I've been through uh, situations in the community where I work of where people are, have tragedies happen in their house and, or, and their home and around their neighborhood. And it's, it hits home and it, I saw in his face, I saw in his pain and his pleading and the people who were talking about it, that it was painful to them. And I saw my friends, I saw my coworkers and it, I, I really can't put to words how it made me feel, but angry and sad that this is happening in our nation and in our world. And I know it's, it's commonplace for black people to go through or well, not. I mean, that's important. And I, I, but it's one thing after another, it seems, with police. And I don't know, sorry if my, my mind's jumping around a little bit, but it's, it, it sickens me, it disgusts me. And the more I follow it, uh, the more I believe in the case of all the, the protesters. I mean, the rioting is rioting. And while I can't always um, condone all the breaking of property and stuff like that, I mean, Martin Luther King says writing is the voice of the, of the oppressed or, and I apologize if I butchered Dr. King's words there, but I mean, uh, being, uh, uh, working in a black community for so long, like I've, I've seen the oppression. I mean, my, my school's been underfunded and defunded constantly and we've had to make do and we've made the best out of every situation, but things like this keep happening and happening. So I understand that, a lot of people have had enough. Black people have had way too much for way too long. And it's like the civil rights movement never ended, honestly. And I apologize. <laughs> I feel no, like I'm rambling fine. at a point. Um, but I, no, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, go ahead, sorry. No, you're fine. I, I, it's a lot to unpack. Um, but I think, well, I'll ask you this. What do you think about some people that either looked at the case, the video, or looked at the protests and they feel that it's, it's not warranted or it's overblown? What, what can you kind of put yourself in those shoes or do you think you could even understand how a person could get to that point? 
I, I do understand how a person get to that point because I've got a lot of family members arguing that uh, the, the protests are too much and the protests aren't getting anything done and that Black Lives Matter is a Democrat funded yada, yada, yada by George Soros, yada, 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 that kind of thing. So I, I, I see how people can think that way because people I, I know and people that I care about think that way. And I've, I've listened to them, and it's part of my language, but it's nonsense. It's, it's lines being fed to them by the Fox Newses. And it's, it's like they're not having any empathy for anyone but themselves. And what it, what it makes me think of is that these people have lived in privilege their entire life, and they, had, they don't even have any idea that someone could live differently from them, be it in a city, be it in a country. But just because they're not seeing it just because they're not experiencing it that means it's not as valid to them and they they outright refuse to listen to anybody else's point of view so i i, I try to see what where they're coming from but at the same time it's just i mean it, it's nonsense but it's it's the same family members that um say poor you for working in this community and uh you feel you must feel so bad working with these children and uh, and it's I have to correct them and I have to tell them exactly what it's like that everybody, people are just people. They just happen to be poorer than other people. They happen to be black just because they look different, just because they live in a city, just because they're poor doesn't mean they don't have a lot of the same experiences as you. They see them as completely different people in a completely different world. And like, they're not exposed to it. They're not, they don't see it. Um, and it's, it's frustrating because I worked in I worked in um, the urban setting during the um, the riots in Baltimore, and I had to talk to children about what's what's happening. And these these children knew more than I ever thought they would. And these these kids were were ten years old, and they were some of them were out running the streets during the riots in Baltimore. And I I try. It's, it was hard for me at that time to really think of what the, those children are going through. But at the same time, they, they don't have anything else. They don't have the support. They don't have the, the rec centers. They don't have the youth sports leagues. So all the people that were condemning the riots then, uh, condemning the protests now, um, it's, they just don't understand what some people's angle is and what some people are coming from in their experiences because anything out of their experience is totally foreign and uh, wrong to them. So it's, it's, it's frustrating working in the urban setting with uh, great people that just happen to be poor and black a lot of times, hearing from my privileged family members of like, oh, you, you poor thing working with those crack babies. It makes me want to rage out and slap them sometimes <laughs> but at the same time like I, I try to educate them and I try to paint Baltimore in the most positive light that I can and just show people's true experiences and tell the positives and just help them to see my experiences and help them to see what I go through working in the community like that and it's it's really hard because it just goes back to oh you're a saint for doing this I'm like no I, I enjoy my job I wouldn't leave my job for I wouldn't leave my job for a cushier job in a more affluent area because I just love what I do. And I continue to uh, speak out for the people that I work with because they, they don't have a voice to the people that I talk to. And I know sometimes what I say to them rings on deaf ears, but at the same time, I'm, I'm not going to be silent about it. I'm not going to let the crack baby comments keep going. So I feel like I've exhausted that question. <laughs> no, you, you're, you're good. Um, so do you think um, for yourself personally, if you didn't enter the profession that you did, that you would still have the same feelings that you do about the current situation or um, about what's happening with um, black people and their issues in the country? Uh, I absolutely would not. Um, I, uh, well, I'm, 
I, I'm, I feel okay at least saying what my profession is, if that's okay with you. Yeah, you're fine. Okay, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an educator, and uh, I, I teach early elementary, but I, um, like, during the, uh, the protests and riots in Baltimore year, years ago, I was teaching third grade, so I was teaching older children. Um, however, um, if I did not go and teach in Baltimore, I still would have had a lot of exposure to the black community because my parents were educators in Baltimore as well. And um, I was one of the, the kids, especially for my mom, when I had a day off of school, I was going into school with my mom. And she worked in a primarily African-American community as well. And I grew up, yes, seeing color, but at the same time, not caring as much about color. I was playing with those kids. I was messing around with the pre-Ks when I was a little bit older and just having fun with it. But at the same time, when I went into teaching myself, I started with seeing the, the nitty gritty, the day to day of dealing with parents, dealing with children, dealing with um, members of the community. And I didn't always have the most positive experiences with members of the community. But at the same time, I really started to see a lot of the experiences of what people go through in, a, in Baltimore City. And really just seeing that people are people, some people just yeah, it's a, a bit of a different culture in the city, but at the same time, just seeing their experiences living in these red line districts and in the, the black butterfly areas of Baltimore and just seeing how different it was from my living in the suburbs up in Pennsylvania, living, um, living in a rural area, having been born in Baltimore and lived in Baltimore part of my life too, uh, just teaching in the Baltimore community just gave me a bit different uh, viewpoint on people who live there and the black community. But one of the biggest things came from when I, uh, I earned a master's degree. I, I had a great professor who uh, taught us about white privilege and asked us a lot of questions and really dig deep and dive in of, what it means to challenge our privilege. And being that kid who uh, kept going into my mom's school and went into my dad's high school every once in a while, I thought I had no biases. I thought I was the least racist white person in the world. And I realized that having been raised in a extended family that had a quite a bit of racists in it, I had a lot of ideas subconsciously steeped into my brain that where I thought certain things were one way, but the world was actually another way. And really going through those exercises that that wonderful professor had us go through, and boy, was I perturbed to her at the time, but at the same time, I, I really was able to see that certain viewpoints of mine, while I wasn't doing any active harm to anybody, I, my viewpoints may not have been as sensitive as they needed to be in regards to the children that I teach, the parents that I deal with. And it really helped me to become more empathetic to what they're going through and change my approach. Because I was a, I was a disciplinarian, not harshly, but at the same time, like I just wasn't as sensitive to children's needs as I, I needed to be at times. Like I was, uh, I've always done a great job building relationships with the students and building an atmosphere in my classroom. But at the same time, I wasn't making it as culturally sensitive as I could. And I wasn't making it as inclusive as I could. And having the teaching in Baltimore for over 10 years now, gaining my master's degree and doing those exercises where I really had to challenge myself and really challenge my thinking it really opened my eyes and it, it made me a better teacher. And I feel like a better person because it helped me to see the world in different ways and just see how uh, white supremacy is just embedded into our system and how everyone in the black community is suffering from, maybe not, well, yeah, I'm suffering from white supremacy. And it's not just a Nazi raving, waving a flag at a rally. It's the redlining. It's the 
of the banks not giving loans to black people who deserve them as much as white people. It's just the institutionalized nature of white supremacy in the United States. And teaching in Baltimore, teaching in the black community, earning my degree uh, like I did, I, I really uh, feel like it changed the way that I, I interacted with the world, but also how I saw color and what different people were going through. Because I know I grew up with some privilege now because some of the, the dumb teenager stuff that I did, I said, oh, it was harmless, it was innocuous. There's, I, there were black children who get killed for that by police. And if I were caught doing what I were doing, if I were black, I would have had a criminal record sheet now instead of not having one. I was giving, given advances and chances in my life that black people may not have. So I'm, I'm trying to use my platform to better my community that I work in, trying to be the best educator that I could. So it was, so working in Baltimore City, teaching in Baltimore City has been a really transformative experience. And like, I, I want to share my experiences with people. And that's, that's the reason why I'm here with you today too, is because I feel like I've got a, a, decent opinion and a decent viewpoint to uh to speak from yeah i appreciate that and i appreciate you um bringing up the idea of challenging um your privilege or um at least examining your privilege which uh i think might be a little more digestible for some people and it is a difficult topic for a lot of people and I think about myself, I was a um, resident assistant in college for three years. And the first time I heard the concept of white privilege was my junior year at a RA training. And I remember even back then, you know, the tension just even saying that um, and how people reacted. But in reflecting on your um, development, and I think reflection is a very powerful tool, uh, if you feel comfortable, can you think of any specific things that may have been explicitly told to you as a child or maybe you just picked up on that you then realized, oh, this this might be problematic? Uh, I, I, I can't pinpoint anything specifically. However, um, just the tone from... Uh, my grandparents who lived in a it, it's it was a diverse neighborhood uh being that there were a lot of polish a lot of italians a lot of irish there weren't there weren't really black people but um as time went on as my my grandparents got older i remember comments from my cousins and my uncles about oh, neighborhoods getting a little darker and i would look outside at the sky and say like i don't, I don't know what you're talking about and they'd say like, oh, the a black family moved in. And I especially remember my cousin saying, uh, N words moving in, grandma and pop are moving out. And like, and I just look at him and we played with those children. Like we uh, ran around the neighborhood with them and because our grandparents watched us all the time. And I'm like, what are you talking about? That I don't remember the names of the kids, but like we played like other children with them and just the 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 subtle things the the tone of my my cousins the the words of my my grandparents while i always thought my grandparents were the sweetest most loving people in the world i uh, just even remember them dropping the n-word right now it's just like it confuses me and it's at odds with what my memories and my feelings are with them but it's yeah it's not so much just a not a specific thing that I was taught because my, my parents were very, very inclusive. And I mean, I lived for the first five or six years of my life in Baltimore city and we were the only white people on the block. So I was, I was well worth, well, well used to playing with black kids and being around uh, black people. I just didn't understand it. But now um, with all the, my experiences and everything, it's, uh, it's just the tone and like the, the subtle comments and the, the way that they would almost shun people of different colors. 
And I remember there was another family of, of white kids around the other side of the block. And those kids were fighting and nasty and mean. I didn't hear any comments about them. So it was more of just uh, skin color and less of uh, behavior. Yeah, so some of those indirect things that um, even till today, we know a lot more about child development, but people still don't realize how much children pick up on things. And so um, kind of like you uh, explaining that you, you saw them uh, being singled out one way or the other whether it was the tone or the comments or the, you know, the reactions. And so uh, I would imagine for somebody that even if you're not being told explicitly, this is, you know, a, a bad person, you can pick up that your family doesn't feel comfortable around them. And like you said, it might not be something that you took directly, but, uh, you know, it kind of goes with you one way or the other. And so, yes. uh, to and I, I feel like, go ahead, continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, I feel like that's trickled into my, um, my teaching because, um, even a, a couple days ago, we did a training, um, about restorative justice and, um, I'm currently reading a book from a company called Akabin about it. And that's, I mean, I just got out of, got out of school a couple days ago, so I'm just enjoying my time off right now. <laughs> but at the same time, like I'm, um, the, the book that I'm going to read about that, it, it really talks about a lot of statistics. And essentially, like one of the things that really stood out to me that it's, uh, I'm hoping to inform my instruction on is that um, when observing children, uh, teachers, no matter what, uh, black, white, Asian, whoever, no matter who was observing these children, the, the black boys and the black girls tended to be reprimanded for behavior no matter what. So like that kind of thing, I, I really want to, cause I really want to try to remove some of those unconscious biases that still may be there. Cause I mean, it's, it's a little different for me too. Cause like my class this year is I had 100% black children. Uh, but at the same time, I deal with a lot of other children around the community and stuff like that. And I don't want to be a part of that statistic. And I don't want my, hopefully previously ingrained personal biases come out in a time like that because I mean, kids are kids, mm -hmm. but I don't want uh, the race of a kid to determine what my reaction is, or I don't want children to, I don't want children to be improperly labeled or singled out because of who they are. Like I want to, like I always say when I teach every kid needs a, their own individual plan and I want to be able to hit the kid where they or teach the kid not hit the kid no way uh, teach the kid exactly where they need <laughs> I'm not I'm not advocating for hitting children <laughs> I got you um, it's a different day <laughs> yeah 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 um, but I just I want to be able to I want to be able to, to remove any implicit biases from my uh, observation of children and teaching of children and just teach them as kids, not as the Baltimore city, city kids they are, whether I get an immigrant child, whether I get a Hispanic child, whether I get a white child, whether I get a black child. I just want to teach them as kids, not as black kids, not as, uh, not as an immigrant child, because we deal with a large immigrant population as well. But at the same time, being sensitive to the needs of the community that I work in. So it's, I'm really hoping to get a lot out of that book from Akabin, but at the same time, like I'm, it's a lot is confusing right now. And I'm, I'm happy to come on here and talk about it. And I'm happy, like, I'm hoping this informs my uh, thinking and my viewpoint as well. Yeah. I, I think it's difficult as uh, somebody that's been in education as well. Um, but like you said, it, it's, it, it's kind of no matter who's looking at the child, because I think media plays a lot of role in that in our family as well, because if you don't have experiences with somebody um, and your only experiences are or if you don't have experiential experiences, if your experiences are just, you know, secondhand through TV or whatever, and you get into an education setting especially with children, uh, I see people start to project 
they start to project like if a, a child is doing this certain behavior, they start to project like, oh, no, we, I got to correct that because you're going to end up being this or you're going to end up doing this because that's the only projection they have for that child of that certain race. And only if you start interacting with other people, then you start having different ideas and opinions, uh, you know, subconsciously of what that child could do or turn into. I think, at least for me, that's what I've seen. Um, and it does come with just diversifying your experiences, which is, uh, I think, key in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, I have a lot of thoughts on restorative justice, but I won't talk about that right now. I do think it's a very powerful tool. But sticking to this idea of privilege, so um, what do you think for you personally or from any experiences you've had with other people, what was so challenging about talking about your privilege or having to examine it? Um, being a stubborn person, um, just somebody challenging me on what I thought was one thing, and then they're telling me it's another thing. Like, I thought that, well, the, the main question that it came down for me is the question in a, in a essay that I had to write for my, uh, my class, I had to, one of the questions that I had to answer is like, should we be more sensitive to children based upon uh, their cultural experiences and race. And I said no originally, because the old disciplinarian in me, I really thought that like, no, kids are kids, kids need, um, I'm gonna be the same disciplinarian for all kids no matter what. But at the same time, just um, I was exposed to a lot of valid viewpoints and I, and from the class and a respectful discussion, which I really appreciate. I, uh, and I could, I could see how somebody would have been mad at me for my, my viewpoint at the time, but through respectable, respectful discussion with my professor and my classmates, I was able to see that, heck yes, we should be sensitive to children based upon their cultural experiences and their race. I mean, I have, I have uh, children, refugee children coming from Africa and trying to blend in with the children in my class. And they come from an entire different cultural viewpoint. How do I hold that child to the same standard to a child who has not been traumatized by fleeing a war-torn area, being in a refugee camp? Uh, and all the other experiences they have. And the same aspect, I deal with a lot of children, especially in Baltimore, with lead poisoning. How do I, how do I hold those children to the same, uh, to the same standards as children who have not gone through that? And I can hold them to the same standards, but I need to give them their own supports and I need to be sensitive to what they need to be successful in an American classroom and with American kids. Because, I mean, most of the kids that I teach are um, free and reduced lunch children. But a lot of them come from two-parent households. They come from uh, stable families that they're just a normal little kid, just poor and black. They don't have the same experiences as the child who's coming from a war-torn African country who's been in refugee camps since before they can remember. So I, I learned that I had to be culturally sensitive through that dialogue and through that question and answering and through challenging those beliefs just to learn and become more sensitive to what each child needs. Because, I mean, I, I teach very young children and I have co some coming in with developmental delays and that immediately need special needs services. And I have ones coming in that could skip directly to the next grade and not even be in my class. So it's, I, I learned that I have to be very sensitive to the needs of the children and really develop a relationship with them to see where I need to teach them and 
what skills they need to be able to be in a classroom. Because, I mean, like the little African boys, they, they are, I mean, I had, a, I had a great conversation with this boy's mother. He, he's allowed to run. He's allowed to do whatever he wants at home. His little sister has totally different expectations. And she's, even at a much younger age, she can sit quietly and she attends to you while the older brother, he was allowed to be wild and fight and um, just, you know, the different cultural expectations. And I had to teach the, the little boy, he ended up doing phenomenally, uh, just that the, the, the different culture, you know, the expectations were different. If I treated him like a normal American student, I would not have reached him and he would have been a terror all year long. But because I was able to have that conversation, develop that relationship, I was able to reach that child. Without checking my privileges, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have known that my approach should have been different. And in challenging those beliefs, how, having those discussions, I, I really started to see that I had, I, I've seen a lot of the same things in children before I was able to check my privilege. My viewpoint of them afterwards is what changed and my teaching and my approach and the way I spoke to parents and developed relationships with them too. It's, it really, um, it's, it's harder in a way, but at the same time, I have a, a great school community now where I have a lot of people coming back to me just because they, they like the way that I taught their child. And I have other teachers coming to me and asking me how, how did I reach this little boy because he's driving them crazy in their classroom. So I, I'm, I'm able to, to help them years beyond just because I changed my approach for that. So changing my approach, checking my privileges, it was really, really hard. But at the same time, it, it's paid dividends because it, it changed how I see the world. And I call my, my teaching in Baltimore a transformative experience. Like I'm a different person I was than five or so years ago when I got my master's and a 100% different person for the most part um, when, so when I started, just because I know that I would not be where I was if well, it, there's a good chance I would not be where I was if I were a black person. I would not have had the same opportunities. I would have not had the same experiences. I would not have seen things differently. And it's hard for people to see that. And it's hard for people to put another person's shoes on their feet and walk a mile in them just because they don't know any el anywhere else. And they don't know anything out of their short-sighted viewpoints to do that. And checking mine even though it was difficult and it was some mental pull-ups and mental work that i had to do i it, it really helped me be a better person and be a better teacher and i i'm really grateful that i did that because i'm now that i'm raising a daughter like just the the little things that i do i can i don't want to give her the wrong idea about things but also i don't want to I don't want her to be steeped in the same culture that I am. So that, so she could be my little, uh, <laughs> she could be my uh, entry into the world, hopefully a uh, like-minded person to myself. <laughs> gotcha. Sorry if I'm and rambling. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, I mean, listening to that, I think when we talk about uh, privilege, at least for me, I immediately go to like kind of things in our personal life, but I think that's a unique perspective. And if I'm hearing you right, like what you've been able to accomplish in your profession makes you reflect on that privilege in a, in a way that you're grateful to have gotten what you got, because you know that uh, just simply if you were born different, it would be, you know, a different set of circumstances. And yeah, so, that, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's a different way than um, I've heard most people look at it. So that's definitely interesting. Um, so, I mean, we're getting towards the end here, but I wanted to get your um, perspective as we pull it back to today. So there's obviously a lot 
going on. There's a lot of feelings, emotions, and uh, thoughts and opinions on both sides. Um, what, what's been your level of comfort in these discussions, uh, either virtually or in person? Um, do you feel that sometimes you uh, are being told that you shouldn't speak up or do you feel comfortable speaking up or how, how's your approach or at least how you're seeing people interact online? Uh, it, it depends on what the person is saying. Um, if I have, uh, I, I work with some amazing people and when it comes to um, the, my, my black coworkers who are speaking out, uh, posting things online, I, I try to listen. Um, and if I do say anything, uh, it is to add a little bit of my, my perspective and my view in support of what they're saying. Um, because I, it's, my, it's not my time to lead. Um, me, uh, me being a white person, it's, it's, it's not my time to talk. It's my time to listen. Uh, however, if I come across a person spouting nonsense, uh, like I, I, I had to sever a relationship with one of my oldest friends because we were having a, a discussion amongst uh, some people I went to college with about the riots. And I'm giving my experience and I'm telling that I have coworkers protesting in Baltimore right now, not rioting, uh, peaceful protests. And he said he's got bullets for all those, uh, those people in those protests. And I, I asked him what he meant and I got him to clarify. And he was pretty honest with what he thought. He thinks they should go and shoot. And so I had to sever a relationship with that. When it comes to people like that, I feel I need to speak. I feel I need to defend the people that I work with, that I, the, the children that I love to work with, that uh, I love seeing on a daily basis. And my coworkers that are some of the most hardworking, intelligent people that I've met in my life, that their, their viewpoints are valid. And what they're going through is real. They're not having a, a racial temper tantrum, but they are fighting for their lives, literally, in a lot of cases. And having been an educator in Baltimore, I've worked with families who've lost family members to gun violence. Um, I've worked with, I, I taught a child whose either older brother or father was killed by a police officer. And... I try to share my experiences with that, with the people who are condemning the riots and condemning everything that's going on. But when it comes time to the, the black leaders in my school, my boss, our community liaison, all the other incredibly intelligent people, I listen just because I, I need to learn from them because I didn't grow up in the same world as them. I lived in Baltimore, but at the same time, uh, my parents had the ability to move out, so we, we moved out of Baltimore, and we lived in the country and then the suburbs for a while. So it's, I, I have times where I need to listen, and there's, there's times where I, I can speak. And I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak here and online and when they give me the opportunity to speak. Uh, however, you know, there's times for white people to speak. There's times for white people to listen. And depending on who I'm talking to, like I do a lot of talking or I do a lot of listening, <laughs> just depending. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I think that's definitely a, a, you know, reasonable approach to it. Um, funny enough, I like, I didn't know that um, my first guest and you were both educators. I didn't, I didn't know that going in. So um, it, it's interesting that uh, it seems a lot of educators are the ones that um really are coming to the forefront of um, speaking about this, but removing that education, you know, cause I'm in it too as well. And so removing that from us though, and looking at people that might not be in education, that might not be, you know, 
more predisposed to the, looking at these different viewpoints. At the end of the day, whether it's people you know personally or people you've seen online, in your opinion, for um, white people that are on the other side of this and not in education, what do you, or that are, you know, resistant to everything happening, what do you think, in your opinion, is that common thread um, that's holding them back from understanding what's going on? I think it's, I think it's just fear, really. Uh, it's fear of the unknown, fear of change, fear that if black people are treated the same, they would, will somehow be treated differently. Uh, fear that uh, their world will be different if other people are given equal rights. And I, I, I've seen it for uh, the LGBTQ community. They don't understand it, so they fear that too. Um, and among other issues, I feel like the common thread is they're, they're afraid of change. And they, I mean, everyone thinks that they're right. So they, when their ideas are challenged, then they A, think they're right, but also B, they're afraid that if, again, somebody has equal rights, that means that their life will somehow be different. Because uh, they, I have to explain to some people that just because black people or LGBT, members of the LGBTQ community, they're not, they don't want more than you. They just want the same as you. And I don't know, I don't know why. I guess it's just change, but I, I think it's fear that, that holds them back. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that uh, being one of the underlying causes. Um, but uh, we're gonna wrap it up now. Um, feel free to stick around after I sign off and we could continue to talk. But uh, for everybody listening, thank you for uh, checking it out. Uh, please go to the comment section. Let me know uh, what you think about this conversation. If you have anything to add, uh, please share it around and get the conversation uh, going. Thumbs up, subscribe, and thank you for going out of bounds.